Hi, everyone. I'm Shertia Brantley, Deputy New York Bureau Chief and Senior Editor for the Bloomberg Equality Summit. And I'm excited to discuss the findings from the Representations of Black Women in Hollywood report by the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. With Gina Davis, Academy Award-winning actor, founder and chair of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, and Lorraine Toussaint, award-winning actor and activist. Welcome, Gina and Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So great to be here. It's an honor to speak with both of you. We have a lot to cover, so let's just dive in. Gina, I want to start with you. The report shows that Black women and girls comprised only 3.7% of the leads or co-leads in the top 100 grossing films over the last decade. But Black women and girls comprise about 6.5% of the U.S. population. What's behind this disparity? Right. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pathetic. Uh, but um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so characters overall, uh, if you count you know, all the characters in, in a movie, uh, it is, we have reached, I mean, we are at pretty much parity with the percentage of the population. But then when you get down to the leads, it cuts uh, at least in half. Uh, and so why is that? Well, uh, I, I think it's the same phenomenon as... Um, as all underrepresented groups, and uh, and you know, and I've made a particular uh, focus on studying uh, female characters, intersectional female characters. But um, there's far fewer uh, female lead characters uh, in film in general, and and it's been that way since the '40s. Uh, and uh, so, so we we just have a lot of progress still to make in that in that area, but. Um, but at least, at least we have have some sort of um, progress being made in the in the worlds of the movies that are being created. Lorraine, what do you attribute to this disparity? Do you think um, big studio uh, executives uh, still think black women are a risky bet, either in film or in television? I think we're seeing more progress in television, the, the multiple platforms that we have there. <clears throat> and I think in many ways, the television, um, the, that genre has been easier to break into and to break through those kinds of ceilings. I mean, we're really seeing um, exciting work with, with female leads. I mean, if you think of the last decade with um, Shonda Rhimes and, and Ava DuVernay, and there's so many wonderful female producers and, and show creators that are now on the scene that are, that are Cassie, I mean, just... Um, Bridgerton is 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 really a, a terrific shining example of where we've been trying to get for I would say decades and where we finally are when I came up in this business we were talking about non non-traditional casting in the theater and but there was no such thing in television and film and now we're seeing that ceiling broken through with with true non-traditional casting and and in films in things like Bridgerton and and Kerry Washington's company and what Kerry has done in television she's she's brought us forward um so far in terms of black women being not the lead the desired lead um the strong sexy complicated oftentimes we were cast as um very one-dimensional characters. We were maternal characters. I mean, we were sort of glorified mammies, the social worker, the teacher, the, the rather sexless and generic women. Um, but we're seeing that change. It's harder to see that in film. It's a, sl it's a slower road in film. But I, I have to trust that we're going to be doing that. We, we, we haven't stopped fighting. So um, there's a ways to go, but we've, we, we've made progress. Right. Following on that, Gina, how critical is it to have Black directors and showrunners and script writers and producers? Right. Well, it's absolutely essential. Our research has shown, uh, for example, if there's a female writer, producer, or director uh, on a project, the percentage of on-screen characters goes way up. So, uh, so, and it's, and it's also, I'm sure, true for um, black directors and, uh, and producers and writers. And, and it makes a huge difference. You know, it's, I've found that it's easier to 
convince people to add more characters than it is to uh, get them to add more uh, people behind the camera. But it's it's a it's a completely different pro problem because a lot of the lack of people of representation on screen is unconscious bias, and if you can awaken them to their unconscious bias, you can make some progress. But uh, but it's uh, the the numbers for black and female and, and intersectional directors and producers is uh, the pr progress is is you can't measure it. It's it's so glacial. So the nomination for the Academy Awards, nine actors of color have been nominated, the most diverse list ever, with Viola Davis and Andrew Day picking up nominations in the actress in the leading role category. Gina, what's your take? Is this a sign of progress, or can two things be true at the same time? Black women being nominated for leading actor, you know, actress in a, in a leading role, and the lack of still a, a disparate proportionate low number of black women leading in major film projects. Right. Well, I, I'm always uh, uh, reminding people when, when they think, well, now, you know, the Academy has made progress. Uh, it's, it's not really up to the Academy to make the change happen. They can reflect things that, that are very helpful. But like uh, when uh, I remember when um, Catherine Bigelow won the Best Director Oscar. All the press was, this changes everything now. The floodgates are open. Now we're going to see that. And you know, how many years since she uh, since she won has it been? And uh, and very little progress. But but I am excited about it. And uh, and uh, I think it it shows that the you know the Academy has been working very hard on their own diversity, and bringing in um, a lot more people of color as members. And I think that. Is, is reflected by, by the nominations. Lorraine, what's your take on this? And, oh, I'm sorry, and what impact do you think the Oscar, hashtag Oscar so white uh, campaign from a couple of years ago, what impact that may have and what we're seeing today? I think it's made a huge impact because the, 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 the voting body of the Academy, that that has changed, the color of that that body has literally changed. Um, there, there are more women, there are more women of color, there are, there are just people of color that are now voting. And therefore, we're more likely to seek out films that aren't necessarily traditional white male Hollywood films. And so suddenly those kinds of films, those kinds of creators are on the, are on the map and in, in our zeitgeist. Um, what we're also seeing is that when it comes to Gina, um, the, the women that are being nominated, I do think that the, the Black Lives Matter and the, the social upheaval that we've been experiencing in the last few years has, has absolutely impacted this. I mean, because, for example, just recently, I, there's, now, there's now a mandate that there needs to be a, a percentage of, of people of color in films in order for them to actually be nominated as best films. And so I think that kind of unconscious bias that Gina was had mentioned, it, a lot of this is just about awakening people and just making them aware of their own bias. And of we, we, we automatically go to that which is the easiest for us to go to, but how to actually just just keep snapping the fingers at people going, no, no, wake up, wake up and stay awake, stay awake. Um, that's, that's going to be the challenge, but it's slow progress, but we're making it. Now, in the rooms that both of you are in, Gina, are you hearing people reference, you know, March 13th was the anniversary of the killing of Breonna Taylor. Are you hearing uh, the social justice movement being discussed in meetings when you're talking to senior executives? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that, it hasn't really, it hasn't really, that specifically hasn't really come up because we're talking about their productions and everything. But I, I agree with Lorraine that, that people have been tremendously affected by all of that. And, and, and we are seeing um, the reaction. And uh, it's, I think a big problem here is, is that it's not front of mind for people. Uh, and the default is white male always. And so, uh, you know, I'm always saying you've got to do uh, uh, an inclusion pass before you cast this thing. Do an inclusion pass where you say, 
who can become female, who can become person of color, who can be both, uh, who can be an older, uh, you know, disabled female person of color, uh, you know, and, and just use your imagination. I mean, it's the whole industry is based on imagination. So um, that's what we, that's what we need to do. But certainly the social movements have brought much more awareness. Mm -hmm. I just want to bring out a couple of more points from the report. Um, colorism and pressure to conform to European beauty standards continues. Um, of the Black female leads in film, 19% or about one in five Black female leads had a dark skin tone, according to your report. Lorraine, why do you think colorism is still an issue in Hollywood, or is Hollywood just a microcosm for the issues we still have in society? I think it's still a microcosm for the issues that we have in society. Colorism exists in, in white communities, and as quiet as it's kept, it still exists in black communities. And so it's certainly that, again, the, the default is, is white males and what primarily they have found to be desirable. What is their standard of beauty? And that hasn't necessarily even served white women, as, as, as I'm sure Gina can speak to, but it it certainly hasn't served us. We are seeing now, and when, when that did begin to change, it was about black women who were closest to white women, who were light-skinned and had straight hair and had lighter eyes. And that level of colorism um, exists, existed for many, many years. I think it's really, honestly, only recently that we're be beginning to see women of brown skin, dark skin, happy to be nappy black women who are now propagating the screens in sexy, vibrant, um, complex, interesting women, not just in their 20s either. There, that is that level of ageism we're also seeing shift, and I think like black women have had a, a an important an important contribution to that because in many ways we have been on the screen as older women for longer, <laughs> but now we are coming to the screen as older women that are sexy and vibrant and complex. Um, Viola and Carrie and um, Queen on The Equalizer and myself, we're all women in what would have been considered middle-aged, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, there's nothing middle-aged about us, I must tell you. <laughs> we're only getting started. <laughs> oh, Gina, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean that you know that is the goal. That's fantastic, Lorraine, and, and uh, you're you know setting such an incredible example. Um, but uh, but that's the thing, you know. Uh, I, I find very often um, that if if there's a a female character, uh, like let's say in an action movie or whatever, she's she has no personality. She's she's a machine. She's tougher than everybody, and zero personality. All the all the male characters are cracking wise, and she's just let's go, come on. And so, um, and, and it's a little bit like that with 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 black women too. You know that um, that there's not enough colors to the uh, characterization. So, um, so it's very important. It's 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 really important. You know, I've, I've I've struggled with this for a while. That why do the male characters get to have so many facets to their characters. And then it's almost like, well, we're throwing in a person of color or a woman because we sort of have to, but we don't really want to put a lot of work into making them uh, interesting, right? Wow, oh, that's a powerful statement. Uh, the report also showed that Black female leads wore, um, quote, European hair. Uh, styles such as extensions and wigs um, at a rate of 57% of the time compared to 43% roughly of the time for natural hairstyles. Um, Lorraine, this question is for you. Uh, have you ever felt pressured in the past uh, to wear your hair straightened to an audition or for a role? You know, I, I came up in a time when the, there was less pressure, but even as I was coming up, yes, absolutely. But I do remember when I started with Dick Wolf on Law and Order in the, in, nine, in the 90s, the early 90s, I think I was the first black woman on television to have dreadlocks. 
And I happened to know that Roz Cash, who had, was my predecessor, when Roz drew, grew her locks, she couldn't work. And at that time, people would ask me all the time, young actors and actors of color who would say, does it, aren't you afraid that you won't work? And I was always putting forth, no, I am going to own who and what I am. If there is real integrity in my being, if my insides reflect my outsides and vice versa, there's no way that my truth can be denied. And so there, one, I found myself having to stand in my own sense of beauty, my own sense of self. And I think I came up, came up at a time when there was a window, there was a small opening for that. And I was, mad, I was able to sort of squeeze through that. But it had been tough until then. And I still, I think today, even still, there is a belief that we have to straighten our hair and we've got to sort of flat iron and, and press and curl in order to be the leads on shows. And I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, she says, with her big nappy hair, that that is, <laughs> that is changing. Yes. Hi. And it translates into corporate America as well. Real quickly, personal story. When I was interviewing for my job at Bloomberg about four and a half years ago, I had concerns if I should blow my hair out for the interview. And I decided, no, I'm going to show up as my authentic self. And I'm grateful that you know, this organization has embraced that and that I'm on camera right now speaking with both of you. But it is still a challenge. And it's unfortunate, um, the, politi the politi uh, politicized, how we politicize hair and, and, and what we think that implies. Uh, so it is definitely very uh, unfortunate. Uh, in the few minutes we have uh, remaining, Gina, I want to talk about solutions. What are you hearing from the studios? What are you advising them at this time? Well, uh, you know, uh, we've actually seen a, a great deal of progress in uh, family-rated films and, uh, and television made specifically for kids in, uh, you know, race and, and gender and, and all the, the markers. Uh, so I feel like people are, I feel like there is a big difference now than in the past few years. Uh, and, and people are just much more uh they're they're uh they have a much more heightened uh idea of of you know wanting to you know actually them actually wanting to address this so um i uh, you know i think a li one limiting thing is that uh that people seem to be very keen on on following what the writer said well you know basically if if the character isn't specified as white it's still a white character unless you actually write in that it's a, a black character or a person of color. Um, so, so I think people are taking the scripts too literally and there needs to be some freedom to loosen this up and, and you know, cast a broader range of people. If it doesn't say how old somebody is, well, think about it. How old could this character be? Or, you know, uh, and how, how, how can they represent underserved uh, parts of the population. Mm -hmm. Lorraine, what are you hearing or what are you saying uh, when you're at the table? Well, I, um, I have lots of friends who are showrunners and one of the things that, I, that I'm hearing is the diversity in the writing room. Uh, to speak to, 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 to Gina's point is that um, a more diverse writing room and really does create more diverse perspectives and uh, more diverse casting. Um, I am seeing and hearing of, of more um, showrunners and producers who are creating their own works. We're no longer sitting around waiting to be chosen to dance, we're really getting up and dancing. We're, we're, we're changing the music and, and, we're, and if that's not gonna work, we're going to a different party. And so um, I'm seeing a lot of breakout product productions. I mean, we've got the first uh, all black producing team for Black Judas that is that that's been nominated. That's that's a big first. And I think there's a whole underground movement that's happening in that arena that may not be mainstream yet, but we've got one that's already being nominated for an Oscar. So I feel very, very hopeful. That's okay. wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
while I have you, congratulations on the equalizer and being renewed for season two. That's so great. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's a black female lead who is, you know, over 40 and, you know, bleep kicking ass and taking names. And she's complex. She's got a she's got a, a family life. It speaks to what Gina also mentioned. You said she is very complex. She doesn't have to be all hard. She can be a mother. She can be a woman. She can be an equalizer. She can be a rescuer. She can be tormented. She can be joyous. Um, she can be the women that we all know and love and grew up with that we actually are now. So hopefully <laughs> our, the mediums will reflect the marvelousness of who we are right now. Mm -hmm. And before we close, um, can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming film, Concrete Cowboy? Yeah, it's a wonderful film set in the urban Philadelphia. It's a, a small group of bona fide cowboys from the 1800s to present day who are who have a, a cowboy community in in urban Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the few towns where you can have a horse as a pet. You no, know, it's very you know, very few people know that. So it's a new, not unusual to see a horse tied up on someone's stoop. So there's wonderful story with the Driss Alba, Alba and, and, and about this marvelous community who's uh, trying to save the kids, get them off the streets with the love of horses. And so um, that premieres, I think, um, April 2nd. Uh, it's great. a terrific mm -hmm. little film. Mm -hmm. That's great. Gina, in closing, we have a global audience watching this event. CEOs and C-suite leaders across industries, what would you say to them when it comes to increasing their representation of Black women in their organizations? Uh, right, right. It's, it, it's global. As, as you said earlier, it's, uh, it's, in every, uh, it's in every industry. It's in every segment of the, of the population. You know, what I wanted to mention to you is... Uh, uh, that one of you know we were talking about what's going to create a bigger change, and uh, we have this tool now which is sort of revolutionary called Spell Check for Bias, and it can read documents. So uh, it can read scripts, and it will tell you you know what is the breakdown of of who you have in this in this cast. How much time are they on screen? You know how much how many lines do they have? You know compared to others and. Uh, and we're now in the process of getting all of the studios to sign up for this. To do, we're doing uh, test runs for them, and um, I think once everybody has this tool in their in their own privacy and they can run run the things themselves, I, I think it could make a big difference because otherwise we're relying on people to use their own judgment to notice something. And, and you know, everybody has unconscious bias, so, so it's tough to overcome, but, uh, but we're excited about that. What has been the initial response? Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we're, we're basically uh, partnering with every studio in town um, to get this going. You know, it's, it's in the pilot phase right now, so we're uh, testing it for different people, but uh, it's going very, very well, it's exciting. Okay, before we go, I'll start with you, Lorraine. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we part? Um, I'm just very hopeful. You know, we, we've come a very, very long way. And certainly I've been in the business for 30 years. And, uh, you know, there was, when I started out, the only roles that really were available to me were, were, were social workers and um, um, ghetto mamas and um, basically maternal caregiving roles. And I've seen this shift. I've seen, seen the trends shift. And I've now gone to playing, you know, witches roaming around the fields of Ireland or, and, you know, um, or, you know, Orange is the New Black is one of the, that was a real game changer for diversity of women, um, transgender women, straight women, black women, fat women, tall women. We suddenly got to see women in a different light. I think that there is a real movement and it's, it's, it's an exponential movement. It's exponentially changing. I, I feel very hopeful. We've got work to do, but we're on the right track. Gina? Yes. 
Oh, it, it, me. Uh, oh, I was just like basking in your answer. That was uh, that was incredible. I, I I agree completely. We are on the right track. We've seen some tremendous progress, and uh, I think it will will continue. I think we're definitely on a path to um, to making some terrific progress. All right, well, we must leave it there. I could talk to you two all day, but just thank you so much for carving out time to join us at the Bloomberg Equality Summit. Gina Davis and Lorraine Toussaint, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.